Welcome to Rail Fans Canada. I'm Shane Sege. Joining me today is Mary Ellen Gleason, who's the program manager for the Stage 2 Western Extension. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So can you tell us a little bit about the Western Extension in terms of number of stations, kilometers, locations of where it goes? Sure, so we pick up the alignment at Tunney's, which is the end of the current line one. Uh, we're building 15 kilometers of rail. We have 11 new stations that are coming for the west. You're gonna take the train from Tunney's kind of down the existing BRT alignment and then come through uh, along Byron Linear Park and the Kitchissippi Parkway to Lincoln Fields. Uh, and then from Lincoln Fields, we have two lines, one that continues south and is gonna terminate at Algonquin College, and then one that continues west and is gonna terminate at Moody Station. So right now we're here at the future Lincoln Field Station, as we can see behind us. It's a very important station because it's gonna be the transfer point between the future O-Train Line 1 to Algonquin and Line 3 going to Moody Station. There's two platforms here and another one on the opposite side. Don't see it at the moment. Can you tell us a little bit about the layout of the station, the different platforms, how it's all gonna flow and how people will get around here once it's open? Sure, so if you're coming from the bus, you're gonna be accessing from the east side of the station. You're also gonna be able to walk or bike and access from Carling Avenue and come in from the east side of the station. You're also gonna be able to access from the west side of the station near the Kitchissippi Parkway or if you're coming from the east side of Carling. All of those are gonna come up to the concourse level and then from the concourse level, you'll be able to get into the fared paid zone and then access via elevator, escalator, or stairs to any of the three platforms. Here at Lincoln Fields, you can definitely see there's been a lot of progress. Lots of different elements of the final station are already in place. It's very advanced. Can you talk about some of the elements that are already in place that have been installed and are nearing completion at the station? Sure. We're working on commissioning of the elevators. We've got the escalators installed. A lot of our structural work is now fully done. So you can kind of see behind us, we've moved past concrete work. We're working on the finishing touches now. So glazing is still outstanding. We still need to finish the roofing. Uh, and then all of the fair gate installations, the ticket machines, all of the finishing touches to make sure that the station looks great is still yet to come. And We've obviously seen a lot of moves at this station, you know, the old station being partly dismantled and demolished, the bus loop moving from one location to another, there's all sorts of connections being made. How will things change over the next couple of years? You know, we're obviously going to see the bus loop move to its final location, so how do you coordinate all of this and how does this all play out? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of coordination between our team and OC Transpo because they're still providing active transportation right now to the citizens of Ottawa. So we're going to build the permanent bus loop and when we commission that is uh, still currently under discussion. But for now, during construction of the alignment, the buses themselves will see, still use the transit way, still use the temporary bus loop that we constructed until we no longer need it. And then we're going to commission this line and be able to finish the demolition of the rest of the old infrastructure that we're not keeping anymore. So the opening of the line is still a couple years down the road. As we can see right now, we're pretty much at rock bottom <laughs> for the station as far as where the tracks and the trains are going to be traveling. Uh, these trains are low floor trains, so you would expect that the uh, track would be somewhere around here. So what kind of uh, work is going to be done? What kind of things will be in place that will ultimately raise the track up and meet up with the platforms once everything is said and done? Sure, so yeah, we have our subgrade and then you kind of build up from there. So there's sub ballast, which is a kind of a granular layer. We should have sub drains, a bunch of different kind of drainage systems to make sure that the water gets away from the track alignment and then you get into the ballast. So the ballast itself is going to contain the ties and it's going to contain the rail and then also in this layer you're going to have the cable troughs. So this is what's going to take kind of the fiber and various other systems all the way along the alignment uh, and then you can maybe not quite see it in this video but we do have OCS foundations that are installed along the alignment so that also is going to exist in the guideway. We're going to have the poles and then everything that goes up from the grade alignment. Our platforms are not finished yet and the reason for that is because we need to install the track alignment first. So the track alignment needs to be set and then we can pour the topping slab of the station and that's just because the tolerances between the edge of the platform and the vehicle are very tight. So we want to make sure that we're within compliance. So the rail is going to be set and then we're going to be able to pour the topper slab. 
And you've obviously mentioned like a lot of different layers between what we see now and where the track and rail is ultimately going to be. How, how do you ensure that these different elements don't move over time? How do you pack them or settle them so that they're, they're pretty static over, over the long period? Yeah, so granular material is typically done via compaction. So you have a vibratory roller or some type of compactor, and then you're able to measure that against kind of a proctor, which is telling you what percentage of compaction you can expect based off of that type of stone. Ballast works a little bit differently because they don't have as much fines. What they use is something called a tamper. So this uh, is a machine that vibrates the ballast itself and makes sure that uh, the ties themselves won't move and, and kind of make sure everything's going to stay in place. The Western Alignment has 11 stations. What would be some of the unique features found at these different stations that you could speak to us about, whether it be architectural, design layout, or unique features of, of any other sort? So we're going to have a couple of stations that are going to look similar and a couple of stations that are going to be set up slightly differently. Uh, so the first four stations that we have on the West Alignment are all going to be similar where the train itself is going to be in a trench. So you're going to be able to access from street level, whether that's Scott Street, whether that's Richmond Road, whether that's Byron, you're going to be able to come in and then come down into the, the guideway alignment and be able to get the train. As you see here, Lincoln Fields is unique because we have three platforms, which we don't have at any other stations. And then kind of continuing down the alignment, Iris is going to be the only at grade station. So there's not going to be any elevators uh, or escalators. You're going to be able to access from stairs or from a graded pathway. And then Algonquin Station is uh, unique in the sense that it is going to be underground as part of a tunnel. So you're going to have two egress points from Algonquin Station. You can come up to the North Station, which is going to put you at grade, or you can come up to the South Station, which you can get out at grade, or you can continue up to the second story and connect via pedestrian bridge to Algonquin College. Continuing along the highway structure, we have Queensview Station. It's an interesting station because it's close to the highway. We're going to have the pedestrian bridge that's going to connect the north from the south. And then Pinecrest Station is going to be similar to the other stations that we see earlier in the alignment that you're going to be able to access at grade and then come down to the track uh, elevation. Bayshore is going to be a little bit unique because it's another transfer station quite like Lincoln Field. So we're going to have a bus loop, there's going to be a bus station and shelter that's going to connect to Bayshore Mall. And then you're also going to have the stations associated with the track alignment. And then Moody itself, you're going to be able to come in, you're going to have to cross over from platform to platform at the concourse level, and that's the end of the line. So as part of this project, there's been other additions to the communities and the neighborhoods around here. So for example, in the distance, the new Woodruff pedestrian crossing, among many other things at uh, another pedestrian crossing at Queensview. Can you tell us about these additions that are being part, that are being built as part of the project? Sure. So the primary goal of the project is to be able to get the train to all the stations that we talked about, but people need to also be able to get to the train. So there's lots of new maps and stuff like that that we're going to be adding to be able to access the station. As you mentioned, we have the new pedestrian bridge that's going to access Queensview Station and connect the north and south sides uh, of the communities there across the highway. We're also building in several new crossings along the Kitchissippi Parkway. So that's going to help bring people closer to the train, but then also provide more access to the river and then kind of as you see around all of the stations we're beefing up a lot of the active transportation infrastructure. Now on either side of the station we have tunnels mm -hmm. and a flyover. Yeah. What challenges are there in creating these structures, these tunnels, these flyovers on this new system? Yeah, so I think uh, in terms of the structures, there's just a large amount of infrastructure that we've had to build as part of this project. The flyover is one, but many road bridges are also uh, have to be constructed in order to provide access for the guideway because we don't have any at-grade crossings between the road and the guideway. So each structure has its own sets of challenges, typically based off of the size and geotechnical conditions and then similar struggles with the tunnel. So geotechnical conditions have to be taken into account for the design of the tunnel, but more importantly, the design of the supportive excavation systems. So we probably have five different types of supportive excavation systems that we use along the project. Each one is custom fit to the type of geotechnical conditions we have in that area. And then the excavation is done and the SOE kind of helps retain the structure while we build the tunnel and get ready for backfill. Can you tell us about some of the critical milestones that you've already achieved on the project thus far? Yeah, I think a big one is 
what I'm gonna call daylighting the guideway. So we are almost done excavation along the parkway tunnel. So there's only two little sections that are left there that we still have ongoing excavation. But aside from that, we're pretty much at trek elevation all the way down. So the west itself is a great alignment because we're bringing the train a lot closer to people. But the downside of that is we have many road crossings. We're close to people's houses. And so all of the work, the pre-work, all of the structure construction, everything that had to take place in order for us to maintain traffic and be able to build the guideway is taking place. Um, another big milestone that we've had in the West is we already have rail installation starting. So you can see that when you go out to the light maintenance and storage facility just past Moody. So tracks are in and that's really exciting. We're expecting to see a lot more tracks come through over the next year. Now what kind of milestones should we be looking forward to over the next two years and as well leading up to the eventual opening in a couple years from now? So you can see here this station is getting pretty close to being done which is exciting but there is still lots of testing and commissioning, finishing work that has to happen at the station. Uh, all of the rail kind of still needs to be put in, all of our overhead catenary system so you're going to start seeing that come up likely sometime next year. We're going to get poles, we're going to get cables, all of the wires in, and then we're going to finish off the cut and cover tunnels, which will be another big milestone. And then once the rails, OCS is in, then we can start the rest of the testing and commissioning for the line. So obviously being intimately involved in a project such as this, you get to see multiple facets and multiple sides of it. What excites you the most and what are you most looking forward to in the station? So I'm an Ottawa native, I grew up in the west end of Ottawa and so really my favorite part of this is being able to see how much the alignment and the construction of this line is changing the face of the city. I think it's really cool to know that for generations to come they're going to be able to use this system and building something in my own neighborhood really means a lot to me. Uh, so I'm most excited to ride the train from my house. I'm going to be able to walk. <laughs> And as far as uh, the stations themselves, which one do you find most interesting and what would you like the most about it? I love Iris Station. I think that that's going to be a really beautiful station. So Lincoln Field is amazing because it's very big and it's, it's kind of glamorous looking aside from the construction stuff. Uh, but Iris Station is a bit more quaint. It's all kind of at one level. You're going to be accessing it from, on foot or by bike. Uh, you're going to have a lovely creek that's right beside it. You're going to have a lot of green space that's going to come in. And I think Iris Station is going to look really beautiful. So one of the important parts is the tunnel along the parkway, along the Ottawa River. How was that tunnel constructed? Obviously there was a road in the position of where the tunnel is being built right now. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the different phases that had to be done and gone through to be able to be in a position to construct this tunnel and how the tunnel is being constructed in general? Sure. So the parkway itself is uh, the original condition of the parkway was in conflict with the tunnel. In order to facilitate enough space for us to build the tunnel, we had to move the parkway further north, closer to the river. So that kind of went in phases through multiple stages in 2019 and 2020 that helped push both the eastbound and westbound lanes a little bit further north and gave us the space to be able to build the tunnel. The next phase was the support of excavation installation. So along the parkway cut and cover section, what we have is installation of slurry walls. Those are used based off of the geotechnical condition and because the groundwater table is really high, so it just helps keep the groundwater table out while we excavate and construct the tunnel. And then along Byron Linear Park, we have different geotechnical conditions. We've used a combination of secant piles, piles and timber lagging. We've had to do uh, shotcrete and rock bolts when we get into the rock condition because there's been a lot of rock along that section. And then the tunnel construction is able to start. So there's two different types of tunnel construction methods that our contractor is using. One is the Everest Traveler system. So this is, allows them to pour 15 meter sections of the tunnel doing both the walls, the middle wall and the roof all in one go. So the phase is SOE installation, excavation, installation and construction of the invert slab, and then the Everest Traveler can move forward. Another form that they use is peri formwork. So that's uh, what they use wherever they're not using the Everest Traveler and they're often using that when the tunnel shape is, is slightly irregular. So closer to stations or near where we have jet van locations. And then when they do that, they have to construct the walls and the roof separately. So where we're standing right now is in the tunnel, the parkway cut and cover tunnel. 
We're near the western limit of the parkway cut to cover, and we're standing in the westbound direction. So the tracks are going to be here and here, and then we're going to be moving that way towards like these fields. Behind me is the Everest Traveler System. This is a Quebec-made system. It's designed for construction of tunnels. So this is what we're using for the former. So you can see behind me, they're able to pour both the middle wall and the exterior wall and the roof all in one go. So we have each traveler system, which comes in two sets, one for the eastbound lanes and one for the westbound lanes. This provides formwork systems for the cut and cover tunnel. So the way that it works is all the supports are put in place and the concrete is poured, the forms are pulled in, and then the whole system is tracked down to the next section. We can pour 15 meter sections of the tunnel at the time. The long lead time item for concrete structures is the preparation, so the excavation, getting the waterproofing in, getting the rebar in, and then the post pouring is the curing time. So the cycle for these systems to be able to pour 15 meter sections is on average between 7 to 10 days. Sometimes it takes longer if there's a curve in the tunnel, but that's about average. So you can see that we have the wall, roof, and then we're done. There's a section here that's going to provide drainage between the tracks. We're going to have rail on either side of this, and the train's going to move down. And this is the westbound direction. So the way the train's going to get power is via overhead catenary system. In this particular section, this is going to be a rigid side. So it's not going to go from post to post. We're going to have a rigid section that's going to bring the power and be mounted to the roof here. We're also going to have uh, cable traps on the side to provide power, fiber connectivity. There's also going to be tunnel lighting this side. This is a section of supportive excavation where the contractor has chosen to use pilots and lagging. They likely did this because we have soil on the other side and not bedrock. What we see going back and forth are struts and whalers and this provides uh, the resistance to keep the earth back and keep the road open on the other side of the excavation. Thank you again for your time and thank you for speaking to us here at uh, future Lincoln Field Station on O-Train Line 1 and 3. Thank you very much. It's been great.